voice of new life starts now. Good morning and welcome to New Life Baptist Church. I trust that you have been able to get outside and to enjoy all of these crazy warm spring temperatures. We were talking this morning before church started that I can't remember a year where it's ever been this warm, this early, this long. In fact, I heard yesterday on the news that this is one of the warmest record years that they have that we've ever had in Iowa. Um, and it's just crazy to think that we're talking about 70 degree weather the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th, and whatever of March. Uh, it feels like we went from winter clear back in January when we had that blizzard and we had all of that snow and now we're into spring and we're not sure what to do if it gets back to 30 degrees. Uh, but I trust that uh, as you've looked around, there are signs of life around. Uh, as I was out yesterday and cleaning up some things out of the yard, I noticed there's already flowers starting to grow. They're already coming up out of the dirt, and they're already about that tall. And it's uh, kind of a reminder that spring is right there, and we'll be here before we know it. Please, if you would, pray for those that are fighting illnesses and have been trying to get back to meeting with us. I feel like we've had some here and some gone, and and it just keeps changing. Pray for those that are ill. Pray for those that have been sick, that they will recover and be back with us. I trust that as you come this morning that you're ready to study the Word of God together. You're ready to get into the Word of God and to study this together. If you're watching online this morning, we welcome you. Here in person, we welcome you. Whether you've been here one time, two times, or you've been here every single Sunday, and you were one of the originals that met in the living room, in my house, uh, we are glad to have you here. Our desire is that you would come to know Christ. Our desire is that you would grow to love him as we do. And we want you not just to have a guarantee that someday when you die, you'll spend eternity with God. That's wonderful. That's not all that salvation and life in Christ is about. It's about growing in our understanding of him. It's helping others find that and then growing together. And so this morning, as we grow together again, I would invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and go to the New Testament book of Hebrews. Our current sermon series entitled, Redemptive Relationships, Experiencing Our Relationships in Light of the Gospel. Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, and we're going to look at verses 24 and 25, very familiar verses of Scripture if you've at all been around a church or have studied the Word of God. But redemptive relationships, looking at relationships in light of the gospel. You and I ought to be, we ought to see everything in our lives in light of the gospel. When you came to know Christ, you accepted the gospel for yourself and it changed everything about you. It changed someday where you're going to spend eternity. It changed your priorities in life. All of a sudden the things that the world says are valuable, all of a sudden there's this shift where, well, well, this is valuable. People are valuable. You begin to use your time, hopefully, a little bit differently. Relationships. You ought to be thinking about the people that are around you. The only thing that you will take with you into eternity are people. Your family, your friends, your neighbor, your coworkers. Do they know Christ? Because if they don't, they're not headed to the same eternity that you are, and the Bible is very clear. There's two places in eternity. One is a place with God, one is a place without God. And I can say with great assurance this morning, you do not want to be in eternity without God. Because it's forever. It will not change. It's permanent. Why would you not want those people to be in eternity with you if you know Christ? and with God, forever, never to be undone. But our relationships, how do we see them as redemptive? Seeing them with eternity in view. When Jesus walked on earth, he made a point to interact with people, and everybody that he interacted with was different after that. Is the same true of your life? Are people different because they've interacted with you? Because you have shared with them what it means to live and love and serve Christ. 
our redemptive relationships have an eternal impact. And as I've said over and over again throughout this series, the reason why we're not focused on eternity is because we're not focused on God. He is the great relationship. And because of Jesus Christ that we celebrated this morning and remembered through the communion table, it's because of Christ that we have a relationship with God and we ought to forever be grateful for that. But but oftentimes the relationships that exist out here in the world in your day-to-day life, we never stop and think about how they're connected to the relationship that I have with God. I've said throughout this sermon series that there's a vertical relationship and there's horizontal relationships that are affected by that. Your vertical relationship is your relationship with God. Your horizontal relationships are every other relationship that you have in life. Your spouse, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, your job, your church, and that list could just go on and on and on because we know a lot of people. You know, if you take the vertical relationship and you take your horizontal relationships and they intersect, you know what you have? You have a cross. And the thing that brings people into relationship with Jesus Christ is none other than the cross. Eternal relationships, redemptive relationships. We think about our our Sunday series that we've been looking at and we went from vertical relationships with God to horizontals we started last week and I want to begin to keep going through those we're going to build on what we looked at last Sunday in your relationship with the church we're not going back to Ephesians 5 you'll have to listen to that message from last Sunday but we're going to add to that this morning from Hebrews chapter 10 and if you're there the words are up on the powerpoint if you need them Hebrews chapter 10, look with me, you would at these verses, verse 24 and 25. Very familiar verses of scripture. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I asked the question as we began last Sunday morning, how is your relationship with your church? And I I chuckled as we were talking about this after last Sunday's message because Ben goes, you mean the building? And I said, no, I mean the people, the, the people that make up the church. It's amazing to me that if you and I could go back to first century Christianity and we told them, yeah, I go to church on Sundays, they would look at you very surprised. It'd be a foreign thing. You do what on Sunday? They would look at you with straight face and they would say, rather bluntly, we are the church every day of the week. There's a big difference between going to church and assembling as the church. In fact, when you think about the words that you use, you think about talking to people, no, I can't do that because I'm going to church. We need to get to the point where we take that out of what we're saying. We don't go to church. We assemble with the church. It's a biblical concept. I gather together with other believers and collectively we make up the church. But where I go, the church goes because I'm part of the church. And I see some looks this morning like, that's going to take some getting used to. Yeah, it is. Because in our minds, we tie a physical location with a spiritual entity. And that is not the way that God wanted it to be. Case in point, when was the last time that you saw the church building wave its arm? Or kick its foot? You're going, that's ridiculous. Well, in the body of Christ, we are described as the hands, as the feet, as the ears. It's something that's alive. It takes people. I'm going to say something this morning that's probably very, very controversial. You ready for it? It's time to stop going to church. And I know there's probably people going, what? Did he really just say it's time to stop going to church? And the answer is yes. It's time to stop going to church. It's time to be the church. It's time to be the church that God desires us to be. 
Anybody can go to church. But only a believer in Jesus Christ can be the church. Because they know Christ. The story is related of a pastor who went down to the southern United States. One day he was out and about with his daughters during the summertime and they stopped at a local restaurant to have lunch. While sitting at a table with his daughters over lunch, they overheard a couple of older men talking at a table across the way. They were talking about religion and so naturally he began to, to listen to them. They laughed and they joked as they talked about a few of the churches in the area and some of the members of those churches. The pastor could finally take it no more and decided to get up and go talk to them about their criticism of the local churches. He got up, walked over to the table where they were sitting. He then asked the men if they went to any of the local churches that they had just referenced in the area. The first man replied, nope, there are no good ones around here. The other man replied, yes, yes, sir, young man, I, I do go to church. The pastor began to perk up a bit with that comment and said, I've been looking for a good church to go to in, in the community. Do you, do you have any recommendations? Then the pastor asked the man who said he went to church, are you, are you a deacon at, at this church? The reply came back, no. Well, are, are you a Sunday school teacher there? Do you, do you serve in some way? Perhaps you sing in the choir. Again, the reply came back, no. The pastor asked the, man, uh, asked the man who the pastor was of this church, and after a couple minutes, an answer was given. However, the answer that was given was not even the current pastor, but one of the former preachers of the church who had sadly passed away almost six years ago. So the pastor then turned to the man who had said all of this and said, so you belong to a church that you aren't a deacon, a teacher, a choir member, or servant. You also attend a church that a preacher uh, that has a preacher that's been dead for six years. I think it's time for you to stop going to church. You think about it. There are people today that are so out of touch with what's going on in the spiritual realm of what God calls the church. Let me be extremely clear this morning. The biggest danger for believers, there's a danger for you in going to church. You're going, I didn't know that it was, it was dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous. There's a great danger because you can go to church and you can leave without realizing that you are the church and the mission goes with you. You can walk in those doors, you can sit down, you can go to church and leave and never think about what it means to be the church. And to say this morning, you are among a lot of people. Because the church of God is not thriving. In some places it's dying. Because people are going to church and they forget that the mission goes with them. They forget that the ministry is them. They are to take the ministry with them. God did not desire for his church to be some weak little church. In fact, the main concern is not whether you even go, it's if you are, because God's church has a mission, it has fellowship, it has stewardship, it has evangelism, and above all, it's making disciples. I stated this last Sunday, but the church is not something you go to or attend once in a while or become a member of for the purpose of getting attention. Many, we treat the church like a country club or, or like a restaurant. You come in to serve, right? No, let's, let's rewind. People come in to be served, not to serve. Look at the example of Jesus Christ. He came not, not to be served, but to serve. People come to be spectators but never want to join in the work. We treat church as a membership to a club and as long as you pay your dues, as long as you come a couple Sundays a month, you don't speak too badly about it, you're considered a fairly good member of that local church. But when I read Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25, I get a very different understanding of church. I'll ask a question this morning, even though I probably already know the answer. Is attending a local congregation of believers important? Yes or no? Absolutely. And some would follow it up with yes, and some would follow it up with no. And 
And the people that unfortunately a lot of times will answer that with absolutely no are people who have been hurt or offended by the church. And they forget that it is not Jesus that did that. It was people. And we're sinners saved by grace. We're not perfect. If you've been hurt by somebody and you are avoiding a local church because of it, and I'll never go back to them, I'll never ever be ministered to again, can I just say something very bluntly this morning? You are missing something that God intended for you. And the Bible says that you are to forgive as you have been forgiven. You need the ministry of the local church in your life. You have some blanks on your outline. I want to give those to you this morning. Every believer should get connected to and stay connected to a local church. Being a part of a local church is biblical. In fact, when you look at the book of Acts, which is where the church started, Acts is the history of the church from the beginning and, and going forward, as it grew, as it developed, as, as it blossomed, okay? In all of those situations, every single believer that came to know Jesus Christ were all connected to a local assembly of believers. All of them. And it is just as important today, if not more so, for you to be connected to a local body of believers. And it's not just that you attach yourself to that fellowship of people. It's that you stay in touch. You stay connected. We all have phones. The day you're at work and the day that your phone dies and you're no longer able to connect with Facebook, you're no longer able to pick up the phone and call your coworkers. you're no longer able to, to check your favorite sports teams, you feel as though you are not connected to the world that we live in. If you're not with the church as it assembles, who are you really connected to? Every Christ follower should get connected to a church family. You need one another in your life and you you say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And the answer is absolutely. I would agree with you on that. True as that is, sitting in a church building doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting at McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. But you might have to get one if you're sitting there. The issue is not that you have to go to church to be a Christian, but that you want to gather with the church because you are a Christian. The issue is not that you're going to go to hell if you don't go to church. But if you know Christ and He saved you from going there, then you'll want to go meet with the church to worship and express your gratitude to Jesus Christ because He is the reason why you're celebrating. And I use assemble. The word that I want you to think of with the church is the word assemble. We never like to put things together, right? You ever bought anything new and you bring it home and it's in a box, right? And it says on the outside, some assembly required, right? And you open it up and you dump everything out on the floor and you're like, all of these little bolts have to go into this somehow? And then you pick up the instructions and you're looking at the instructions and, and you can't read them because they're in another language. And there's pictures and you're, you're trying to follow the pictures. Does that go in there? What bolt is that? And, and you struggle to understand how the assembly works. And then you get it all put together and you're so proud of yourself and you go to put it somewhere and you realize it's about a half inch short on the one side. There's a lot of people that think that when we assemble with other Christians that God doesn't know how to make it work. If God saved you and he died for the local church, he understands how to assemble it together with the people that are there for his divine intentional purposes. And it will not be a half inch off if it's done the way that he desires. In Acts chapter 2, the believers met because they loved Jesus. Everything they did was truly about Him. That's never supposed to change. In fact, no one told them that they needed to meet together. 
It just says that they wanted to meet together and they did it daily. In our world today, it would be wonderful to meet with the church of God, the people, every single day. In fact, it would really be hard to get off spiritually if you met every single day. But in the world that we live in, that's, that's just not practical. We have jobs, we have obligations, we have families, we have things that have to be done. But when the church does get together and they do assemble, do we make it a point to be there? This morning's message is entitled Your Relationship with the Church. And let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, quiet our hearts before you. Father, be with the message that you've laid upon my heart. Give me clarity of thought this morning. Give us the time that we need to get through this. We're going to have to rush. But Father, your word is faithful. Hide me behind the cross. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first century AD, when the book of Hebrews was written, Christians were meeting in relatively small groups in homes. We might even say today there were church plants everywhere. It would be a different kind of a mentality if everywhere that you went, there were no church buildings. You drive into a town and you're looking for a local church and there is none because everybody's meeting in somebody's house. There's a church on Baker Street. There's, there's a church on Elm Street. There's a church over on Fifth Street. And that would be what it would be like to be in first century Christianity. And I would even dare say in first century Christianity, there there weren't even denominational groups. There's this group of Christians, there's this group of Christians, there's this group of Christians, and they're fellowshipping. The idea of Christians meeting together in large numbers in a dedicated building, that was a foreign concept. Therefore, when the author of Hebrews, under the inspiration of God, writes these words, not to forsake the gathering together, he didn't mean that they had to gather together in a massive group of hundreds or even thousands of people. How many of you can fit a thousand or a hundred people in your house? Well, then you ought to be glad that this is in Scripture. Because it's still true. The Bible is very clear. It says, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. It doesn't take a large group to assemble. The church can be a church of 20. The church can be a church of 3,000. But wherever the church meets, wherever those two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus promises this. I am there in the midst. And we ought to forever be thankful for that. God wants his people to be faithful in assembling with the church. You might think that that is a bit ludicrous, but there's more truth to that statement than we realize. Faithfulness is not yet extinct in our culture, but it's getting there. It's moving in that direction. It's not dead, but it's, it's pretty sick. Characteristics of faithfulness are certainly one element that's missing. Marriages break up because of lack of faithfulness. Business partnerships dissolve because they're not faithful to each other anymore. Friendships end in bitterness because of a lack of faithfulness and commitment to each other. Churches suffer because of a lack of faithfulness. Unfortunately, faithfulness in words like it, commitment, loyalty, reliability, integrity, they're not essential, they're not important, or so many feel. For you as a believer, faithfulness should be indispensable. Without it, you're not going to be pleasing to God. The characteristic that should mark Christians is that of being faithful. Should mark us because it marks God. God is faithful. Amen. You either believe that or you don't. And then it carries over into the church. God has said, I will be faithful to build my church. You either believe that or you don't. So how is a faithful God going to build a faithful church if we as his people are not faithful to show up as the church? It doesn't make sense. We have to be faithful. Some people see faithfulness as doing one's duty or keeping one's promise or being loyal. The Word of God says that we are to be faithful, period. How are we to be faithful to the church? Very quickly. We don't have a lot of time this morning, so let's get into this. Four ways. Number one, by faithfully attending the services, and you're all going... I knew he was going to say that. I knew he was going to say that, right? 
That, that is the, the text, that is the go-to that everybody says as a pastor. You need to be in church. You, you need to make a point to, to be there. Well, let's look at the text. These are God's words, not mine. Verse 25 says, not forsaking. The word forsaking means to desert, to leave behind. It, it's kind of the military term, right? There's a military branch that's motto is no man left behind, you know. It, it's, it's the idea that you look out for people. It's the idea that you're not to desert God. You're not to deserve Christ. You're not to desert his people. And I think it's amazing to me when I read this and I think contextually that apparently some of the, un, uh, some of the wavering believers had been absent from church fellowshipping together. And this isn't 1960. This isn't 1850. This is first century Christianity and people are already not faithful to church. And all God's people should say amen to that, right? Because if you're not faithful, they were there too. And... It's in scripture. They were struggling. And what I think is interesting is the struggles for why they were not there are very different. They weren't there, as my wife says, they, they, weren't, they weren't there, uh, not there because there, there was a sporting event. They, they weren't not there because they had a bass boat they had to use on the lake. They weren't not there because they had, a, they had this big family gathering that took place on a Sunday. You want to know why they weren't there? It was because of persecution. Now, last time I checked, you're pretty persecuted sitting in a boat on the lake fishing, right? Some of you, your family gatherings might be viewed as persecution. I don't know. But the reality of it is that they were not coming and fellowshipping because they were persecuted. And the Bible is very clear that they were to keep meeting regardless of that. Now, if you're persecuted this morning... You need to go back and you need to talk to these people about the persecution that they faced. Because it wasn't somebody belittling them or spreading rumors or gossip about them. They were literally dying, being killed because of their faith in Christ. That's persecution. And they were worried about that. And the Bible was written very specifically. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And do it so much more as you see the day approaching. Listen, Christian, there's a biblical obligation to be faithful to your local church. People take it lightly. There's a danger in forsaking assembling yourselves with other believers. The Bible teaches that we are to meet together. 1 Thessalonians 2. 2 or 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1 Paul refers to as a gathering someday we're all going to be gathered together to meet him in the clouds and thus we're ever going to be with the Lord that's going to be the first gathering for some because they've never gathered together with any believer anywhere the word assembling age. that's the Greek word for those that like to study it speaks specifically in scripture to a complete collection or a complete gathering together for worship. How many of you have any collections? Anybody? You know, you got every quarter that started with Maine, remember, and it went all the way up through all the states. You got all of them, right? Okay. Let's just think about this for just a moment. If it's a complete collection and I'm missing Iowa, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, is it a complete collection anymore? And you're going, no. No. Okay, so let's, let's, take another, let's take another collection. I have a collection of cars, and I have a 71, a 72, a 73, and a 74, and I'm missing the 72. Is that a complete collection? And you're going, absolutely not. So if the complete collection is missing, if it's not all there, then what is the church missing when you're not there? Because if we make up the local church and you're not there. And it's an assembly of every one that comprises the church. What happens when you're not there? You say, well, pastor, there's times where I'm sick, or, or this comes up, or this happens. And I understand that. I was sick two weeks ago, and nobody threw a fit. But the reality of it is, is that when somebody is gone, we should take note. 
and be concerned, genuinely concerned for them. Why didn't they, why weren't they here? Why didn't they come and why didn't they assemble? And it's not to be nosy. It's to convey that we love them in Christ. And there's a danger, like there was a danger here, when you forsake. It was in the church that most of us learned about Jesus. And you either come to love or you learn to hate the church. You are the church. It's not a business. You're the bride of Christ. It's a body of believers. You handle it with faith and prayer, not money and rules. And if you and I truly love the church as much as we love ourselves, as much as we should, we would be faithful to attend as much as the Lord allows. Most people see faithfulness. Okay, well, I come every Sunday morning for preaching. That's, that's fine. That's great. But your standard of faithfulness isn't me. It's not somebody else. It's God. And that'll never change. There's a sense in which we say oftentimes that the Lord is present where people gather. Two or three of us are gathered. Some services are big. Some services are small. Are we thankful for anyone and everyone that comes? Verse 25 says, As ye see the day. What is the day? The coming of Christ? We look and we see the Lord's coming. It's getting closer, right? He's coming. That means that instead of meeting less and forsaking more, we should be more faithful. Because as the day gets closer, the scripture is very clear. It's going to get harder to live for Christ again. We ought to be living for him. And the Bible says in Scripture here that we're looking at, there's two reasons why people get out of church. Number one, they fall out of love with God. Out of church, out of love with God. You can't love God and not love the church. That was pretty much all of last Sunday's message. But they fall out of love with their brother. Anybody at odds with anybody else in church? Nobody would be willing to admit that, right? But you know what? The reason why people leave churches and go look for another church more often than not is because they won't fix something with a brother or sister in Christ. They forget the one another's. The text says to exhort. Let us consider one another. Not forsaking, but exhorting one another. The word exhort means to strongly advise or earnestly warn, to give earnest heed to. Hey, pay attention to this. I don't know what it takes to get a hold of some people to to get their attention that church is important. But if I could get a hold of their shoulders and I could urge them, you need to be here. It would be out of love, honestly. And concern for them. Not out of the desire to have another chair full on a Sunday morning. There are dangers when you stop coming to church. When you stop assembling with the believers. Here they are, very quickly. Here's one of those. You begin to drift. And we're not going to get all this message done this morning. I already know that. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Therefore we ought to give ourselves earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. You and I, we can drift away. You've seen the wind lately? What drifted away that you have yet to realize in the wind? We can drift away very quickly. The, the idea here is, is to slip or, or to flow or carelessly pass. And the thing about it is we always drift downstream, never upstream. If you've ever floated in an inner tube or ridden on a canoe or a kayak, you understand this, right? You always go downstream. When you begin to slip and you begin to drift, you don't drift toward God. You drift away from Him. You drift away from your Scripture and prayer and and. Consequently, as you drift away from God, you you also begin to drift away from God's people. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh take heed lest he fall. It won't happen to me. I won't drift away from God. said a lot of people that have fallen away from faith in God. I can hear people say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Exactly. However, you don't have to live in the water to be a fish either. You know, there's a lie that the devil has got you to believe. 
When people start missing a lot of church, they will drift on God and they begin to drift out, not in. The writer of Hebrews was written to prevent people from falling away as persecution increased. And we don't have time to build on that this morning. You're going to have to look at that. There's a second thing though. Second, you doubt. Not only do you drift, but you doubt. Look at Hebrews 3 and verses 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. The word to depart means to remove. It means to withdraw. It means to desert. Guess what? It's the same exact idea of forsaking. Same thing. Well, I doubt that I would ever not, not, not do that. I I wouldn't drift away from God. Well, when you doubt and when you drift, (laughs) where do you think you're going to wind up? You begin to doubt. That preacher let me down. That that deacon let me down. That teacher let me down. People get out of church and we blame other people, right? But you know why you don't keep coming? It's because the Bible is very clear. It's your doubt and your unbelief. It's your doubt and your unbelief that gets you out because you've missed too much of what you needed to hear because you weren't there. Say, well, this can't be. Well, let's go a little further in Hebrews. You become dull of hearing. You need hearing aids, spiritual ones. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. You know why it's hard to hear the things of God? Because you haven't heard them enough and you've grown dull to them. There's a third thing, you backslide. Hebrews 6 and verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible, it says, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew again to repentance since they crucify again themselves as Son of God. Whoa! They begin to backslide. Verse 26 of Hebrews chapter 10 that we're studying this morning says, if we sin willfully. Notice the word willfully. It means by choice. It means voluntarily. Psalm 19 and verse 13 says, keep your servant for presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion. When you begin to drift, when you begin to doubt, you begin to backslide. And a habit begins to be formed. And can I say this very carefully this morning? It's not me as the pastor saying this this morning. It's God's word. When you backslide, I'm not going to come after you the same way that God's going to. Because you're his child, not mine. But oh, how there is a danger. Remember some of the things that happened in scripture because people began to uh, backslide? Remember David? He lied, and then he committed adultery, and then he had someone murdered. Why? Well, all those things happened because David wasn't out on the battlefield where God had told him, and he started to backslide. He was the king. He was supposed to be out there with the people. That was, the, that was their job. And he began to backslide on what God had told him to do. Amnon's sister Tamar was raped by him, and Absalom had Amnon killed for it. David lost a child. All those things because of presumptuous sins. And we don't have time to look at all of them this morning. But the reality of it is, is that when you choose to drift and doubt, you backslide. And I would even dare say this. What will happen if you start missing church too much? Have you thought of that? Who does it affect? Because it's more than just you. Does the body of Christ begin to suffer when you aren't there? What about your family? If you're the father, if you're the husband of the house, how is your family affected when they're not in church? How does it affect your kids 10, 12, 40 years down the road? Lest we miss this, I want to make a point and we'll be done this morning. Here's what the Bible says about Jesus and his attendance to the house of God. This is the son of God, right? Nothing's more biblical than Jesus. Can I get an amen? That was really quiet. Let's try that again. Can I get get an amen? Nothing's more biblical than Jesus. 
He is the standard. You think the Son of God went to church? You think Jesus made a point to go to church? Or their, their equivalent, I say that carefully, their equivalent to church. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 tells us, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the reed. He was there in the synagogue. The synagogue is the closest thing in Jesus' day that we have to the church. You know what? Jesus had a custom of going in there and being there and listening to the scripture read. You know what a custom is? It's a long established habit that you have no intention to break. An action that a person has repeated so often that they do it naturally and without thinking. Do you have to think about whether or not to come to church? I hope not. I hope it's one of those automatics like when somebody asks, do you want ice cream? And we always say yes. But there's many people that think and weigh out the options instead of seeing faithfulness in coming to church as biblical. We should have a custom. We should have a habit of being with God's people. To not even allow it to cross our mind that there's something that's more important than this that, that is going to take me away. And I realize there are things that happen. But you know, a thing that happens can very quickly become a habit that forms. And before too long, there's a habit of nothing. And you have to retrace the steps to figure out how you got to that point. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Why do we meet? Why do we come? Verse 24 is very clear. It says this, Let us consider one another. Next time you think about not coming to assemble with other believers, ask yourself this, Is the reason why I'm not going to assemble is because I don't want to share my cold with everyone else? That's a good answer. That's a good excuse. But, a lot of times we don't think about anyone else in church when we don't come. And even more than that, why is it that we come? Notice this. Consider one another in order. This is what we come to do. We come to stir each other up to love and to good works. What is that? Simply put, modern day terminology, we encourage each other, we edify each other, we build each other up in Christ as we meet. And the hope and the goal and the admonition through all of it, the worship, the singing, the preaching, the teaching, the fellowship, all of it, is that something for God would be accomplished in and through our lives as we go throughout the rest of the six days of the week. You really want to get somebody fired up? Go to them and ask them. So, I just wanted you to know, I'm praying that you'd witness to somebody this week. And you know what? They have the right to do it back to you. We're to stir each other up. We're to prod each other toward doing things for God. You know what? When I, when I take a step back from church and I begin to drift and all of a sudden... I am not with other believers. There's nobody to keep me accountable. And I don't have to feel accountable to anybody. And there is a great danger in that. Because your church will suffer. And I can say very simply this morning, you will suffer as a believer in Jesus Christ when you forsake the assembling with other believers. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the privilege that we've had to study your word. Father, I realize this morning that I have gone long. But Father, I feel very burdened that you would have me to, to say what I have shared this morning from your word. Father, I am not the, the keeper of, of people being faithful to church it's you. You are the one who asks us to be faithful. 
And our desire, the desire of every believer, should be to be faithful. And might you help us to get this repertoire out of our minds of going to church and to be mindful that I need, I need to assemble with the church because God has given me gifts and talents and abilities that I need to use to minister. And when I am, when I am not there, something, something is missing. And it requires others to, to step up and, and fill things that, that I would do. And Father, there is a great danger to the one who begins to forsake. Father, keep us from being people who backslide, who drift, who doubt. Help us to make a point to see church as something that we need. We need to be with the church. We need to fellowship. We need each other if love for God and good works for Christ are going to be done. So, Father, encourage us in these things. May we love our churches. Might we love God's people. And might we desire to be with them each and every chance that the Lord allows. We ask all this in his name. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. If it was a blessing, would you consider liking it and subscribing to our channel? And don't forget to hit that bell icon. Thanks for watching.